going to start this session by um, discussing three questions. Each presenter will have, or each panelist will have three to four minutes per question. Um, at the end of each question, if you would like to, um, as participants here, if you'd like to add anything or have any questions for the panelists before we move on to the sec second and third question, we can work in that format as well. And as Ali mentioned, we also have some moments at the end of the presentation, if you have additional questions then. And uh, just the, for ease, the order of the panelists, uh, Jennifer, if you wanted to start, uh, then Amber and then Sydney. And we're asking each of you, how have you successfully used effective communication techniques in large online classes? Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today and for practicing your resilience. I guess uh, we came back from vacation, but Zoom didn't. So um, we'll uh, carry on as we go. Um, it's great to be here. I'm really happy to share some ideas with you. Um, I'm quite a new educator and I do not by any means have this all figured out. Um, I have been on a bit of a journey to get better at this. And so I'm gonna just share some insights that I've had, but I'm here to, um, to learn as much as anything else. So what I've found to be effective with communication is to limit the number of modalities and be very consistent. So there's a million different gimmicky ways that we can communicate with students. Um, I find that if we give students something novel, they have to learn the process as well as focus on the content. So if we say we're going to communicate through Teams or something like that, they have to learn how to use Teams. And as much as we talk about kind of Gen Z or digital natives or those kinds of things, there's still a learning process involved. I tend to avoid that kind of thing because I want them learning the content that I need to cover, not kind of having this side quest of um, going through how to learn to use the apps. There may definitely be a place where you do need to in, have students learn how to use a new technology, but I would suggest taking that into account that they're going to need some startup time there before they're able to use it for communication. Um, I try and go where the students already are. So I use G2L news items um, quite frequently. And I also, when something is high priority, I send it by email. And I do that consistently the whole semester. And I tell them right off the get-go that if you get an email from me, it's a higher priority message, please follow up on that. I use the news items for things like um, I teach research methods. I have like a fun study of the week. The other thing I do there is try and maintain very like consistent types of messages. So on Monday, I set it up so that it automatically posts. Um, this is what you need to do for my course for this week. This was a tip I picked up from a colleague and I found this actually worked really well, especially when students are getting overwhelmed at kind of busier times during the semester. So it gives them a chance to um, say, these are the boxes I need to check. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that um, the written communication and the content is much more important than kind of anything else. Um, I, especially when we're not in person and students don't always think of me as a person. I'm a little square head on a Zoom screen sometimes. So for that, I try to, and I can maybe speak to this in one of the other questions as well, but I try to really use the feed forward or growth mindset feedback when I'm providing um, students with communication. I feel like that has completely changed the tone and um, created a lot more um, just respectful discourse in, in my engagement with the students. So I guess my main messages are limit the number of modalities, be really consistent, don't get too attracted by the novelty and use stuff they already know how to use. So I use B2L, I use email. I know my students also have a Discord channel. Um, I deliberately ignore that. They have a right to communicate themselves. And I think of that quote of like, what other people think of you is none of your business. So I know that they're communicating in that way as well, but that's something I just stay away from and um, let them go with that. So thank you. 
Thanks, Jennifer. Amber, what are your thoughts? Uh, similar thoughts to Jennifer. I think I agree with the whole idea of um, uh, limiting those modalities, having too many different ways of communicating with students can cause a lot of, um, I think, confusion. <laughs> uh, and it does require a certain sort of cognitive load on them and on us to learn, you know, new technologies or new tools or things like that. Um, I, I do pretty similar things, I think, to Jennifer. I, um, I use the uh, announcements and the and email to communicate mainly with my class. I though actually everything I put in announcement that's a main course announcement, not like here's a fun article or here's a you know like sort of things that aren't absolutely necessary more optional things. I don't do this for, but like if I at the start of every week I might do a similar thing that Jennifer was talking about, like sort of like get them set up, like okay this is what we're doing this week, and remember I don't always have. Zoom classes every single week in my courses. I tend to have them either every second week or I might have them at slightly irregular intervals. I always put a reminder of, you know, there's a Zoom class this week or this week there isn't a Zoom class, you're doing asynchronous stuff. And I, I send it as an email and as announcement. It's something actually that I wish that D2L did um, uh, is that when you create an announcement, you could also just automatically click a button and send it as an email, but I just copy and paste it and send it. Uh, in an email. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of sort of my main technique. The other thing that I have found really successful in the last couple of years with being online more is um, the setting up a discussion board um, separate, like I usually do a separate forum. So if we're doing actual discussions and discussions in the class, like for marks or something, I'll, I'll set that up in a separate forum, but I'll have a forum that will have a Q&A um, discussion board in it. And it allows students to ask questions there that they can, uh, and then answer for each other. So you can, um, you know, they can post something. And if I don't see it or the TA doesn't see it right away, oftentimes if it's relatively straightforward, another student will answer the question for them. And so it's often, by the time I see it, the whole thing is sorted like the, the question that they've that they've had and that's cut down on a lot of emails particularly in large classes it's cut down on a lot of emails for me because they can post it there or they can go see that somebody else has answered the question or asked the question there and they can see the answer whether i've answered it or somebody else so that's really cut down on the overload of emails that i find when i teach classes of about 350 the emails can get a little bit ridiculous if everybody's going to email you the same sort of simple questions that you tend to get, especially at the beginning of the semester uh, or near the end or, uh, you know, when there's a major assessment due or something. So yeah, I, I really do like having that Q&A discussion board. That's, that's super helpful. I also ask for a lot of informal feedback just on Zoom, like, you know, just a fair bit, like just asking, like, what do you think of this? Or, you know, just general things about the course. Um, and I think, in terms of just actual communication <laughs> techniques, I've also been told that I talk too fast. And so this is something I've been working on for years now, trying to get better at. But that's definitely something I keep in mind when I'm communicating with them, like on Zoom. Um, or if it's a blended course and we do have face-to-face -face time, that's something that I, uh, I do as well. And uh, the other thing I'll mention is office hours. So I am... Um, I don't do regular office hours in online courses because I have found that nobody comes to them and I just sit with my like Zoom window open forever and nobody ever shows. And so I found it much more useful just to do them by appointment. So in a way that's, I guess, less communication that I've been doing. I haven't made myself just open, uh, you know, every Wednesday for an hour or two hours a week or something like that. I actually just make it by appointment. And most students write to me asking for appointments anyway even if I do have regular office hours, they never seem to want to come to, to the time that I choose. It never seems to work. So, and in a large class, it's almost impossible to choose a time that works for everybody. So um, those I've just done by appointment and I've had them either on uh, Teams or um, on Zoom. So yeah, that's me. Thanks, Amber. Sydney, over to you. Hi. Um, so uh, I've been teaching in large classrooms for almost 20 years now. Um, long time class, like 
maybe not a class like 350 that Amber has had, but um, uh, like I'll have like this coming term, I have like almost 130 per section and I have two sections. So that's been kind of what I've had over the past so many years in nursing. We have quite a few students. So um, before Zoom, you had to have really good communication techniques as well. And so we didn't have online discussion boards. We didn't have all of that stuff. Um, and so to be honest, I don't, I still don't use them. So, so here's, here's where I agree. I do some of the things this, um, that uh, Jennifer has mentioned, but what I do in my class that I found to successfully set it up so that my students know exactly how they're supposed to communicate with me and exactly how they want me to communicate with them is on the first day and because we're on Zoom, I always record my introduction, but I don't record any of my lectures. So I record the introduction for the students so they have it in, in writing, whatever that means. Um, and I do, um, the same things like consistent. I do the, I tell them that I, um, you know, use email, I'll respond to them in 24 hours. Um, and that, um, you know, I'll put in the news certain things that I want them to pay attention to because I typically teach pathophysiology and pharmacology and, and those kinds of, of classes. So it's a lot of information for the students. So what I do is on the first day of class is I set up expectations. So there are expectations for in class or in Zoom and expectations um, outside of class time, how to contact me, what my office hours are, um, which I have because in nursing, we kind of know when our students are in class and when they're not in class or they're in clinical, that kind of thing. So I'll set that up. Um, and so I tell them straight up, this is what I expect. Um, I learned from Reed Ferber a long time ago, if you don't address me as dear Sydney or Sydney, um, and you don't respond with who you are, what lecture you're in, so that I know who it is, not, you know, Dixie 404 or whatever they give me, or I've, I've been, I had an email once or a couple of times from students that says, hey, dude, or Sid the squid, or, you know, like the most unprofessional stuff. Um, I tell them up front in class that if you send me, I know, if you send me an email like that, I'll delete it. I will not respond because you need to learn in nursing how to be a professional. And so, and that, and in my mind, any faculty, you need to learn how to be a professional. So if they don't tell me who it is, yeah, yo, I get that too. <laughs> um, so I, I tell them up front, I'm not going to read your email. So I'm very, very clear. But I also then open the, the discussion to the students and say, and I use the, um, on Zoom, in, in, um, when we were in person, I used like the whiteboard or I used um, like uh, PowerPoint, I would type into PowerPoint, but in Zoom I use annotate. And so I write exactly what the students are saying. And I say, you tell me how you want me to communicate. How do you want to, what do you want to hear from me? When, do, how soon? Like, do you want an email in 24 hours? Do you want an email in the, like in an hour and then I tell them, you know, I have a life, I have a child, you know, I have, I teach other students, I can't respond that quickly, um, but I will in 24 hours, you know, so we have um, that kind of thing. They, they'll tell me how, how other profs have been in their classes and what they prefer. Um, and I treat them like adults. So I tell them, you have a course outline, I go through the course outline. So they know when their assignments slash assessments are. Um, and if we're not in class, which I do what Amber does as well, there are some weeks where we don't have class because they might have a, a quiz and then um, they, they'll have a study um, PowerPoint that they have to study and that kind of thing. 
And so I use blended online as well. Um, but I don't remind them like Amber does. I tell them up front, you need to be, you need to be an adult, you need to look how this works, but I'm very, very clear. I also, I've had students say, but we forget, we can't remember. And if they ask me, then I will remind them. But it's not a given that I'm going to remind the students of when their assignments are due. And, you know, because, um, you know, I never did that in person. So I haven't really, for me, I haven't really changed the way that I have deal with students. I'm just clear. And if I say A, I do A. If I say A and I do B, then I'm going to get bad evaluations. So I am very clear and very consistent with every student. So um, anyway, uh, I'll stop there because we're going to our next question. But that's what I do. Thanks, Sydney. Great techniques uh, as far as how you've successfully used uh, communication uh, in your classes. So thank you. We're going to move on to some strategies and you've already identified some of these, especially around how they can communicate with you. Uh, so we're really interested in the strategies that have best allowed students to communicate with each other and yourself as well. Uh, so maybe we'll reverse the order to this time and start with Amber and then we'll go to Jennifer, or we'll go to Sydney and then Jennifer. Okay. Um... I think one strategy has been um, for me having a very clear course outline. So I have all of my sort of communication policies um, outlined in my uh, course outline, along with sort of course norms and expectations um, around correspondence and communication. And I, I frame them in such a way that um, it's not just what I expect of them, but what I will also commit to as well. So things like I have a 48 hour weekday turnaround policy. I often tell them that, you know, if you send me an email and I happen to be in front of my email, I will write back to you perhaps within minutes or an hour, but the most you'll ever have to wait is 48 hours for me to get back. And usually I'm pretty, I'm quicker than that, but please don't write to me again unless the 48 hour window has gone by. Um, and, but also that I expect them if they write to me, about something that is time sensitive, or if I have a reason to reach, like do a cold reach out to them about something, maybe about an assessment, that I do expect them to check their emails and to respond uh, in a similar sort of way that they, they have to be just as responsive to me as, as if they want uh, just in the same way they want me to be responsive uh, to them and to their emails. Um, and things around like respect and language and things like that. And that's how we communicate in the course with each other, me and them, but also between themselves as well as students. Um, and that, you know, we're both held to the same sort of norms and expectations around those things. Um, so I'm, I, I try to make the that part of the course outline not sound too like, this is what you need to do, uh, like a little too prescriptive. I want it to be more like, um, sort of community <laughs> um, norms rather than, and class norms rather than just like, this is what I expect of you. I also tell them what they can expect of me and that sort of thing. Um, I haven't done the exercise. I know a lot of people really, uh, we, we've talked about it, Sydney talked about it. And, and I know people, a lot of people who do it where they write a lot of these norms with their students. I, with my classes being so large, I find that a little bit difficult, but I generally give them a chance in the first class to say, is there anything that we haven't included that you would like to include? So like I do a little bit, but I don't tend to do a full exercise in actually writing all of the norms and expectations together. A certain amount of them have to be in my course outline to be approved in advance anyway. Uh, and then the others, we, we kind of just talk more informally uh, about. I think other strategies that have worked really well for me are um, also around creating a welcoming and friendly environment in class, um, saying and then actually being open to communication and, and being approachable because you can have a great policy, but then again, if you don't follow that or if you're you know not creating an environment where they feel safe where they can ask you questions or communicate you with you about things um, then it doesn't really help much so I try to do that as much as I can uh, and remind them that they can always email they can always use the Q&A board you know all that kind of stuff um, and remind them of, of their communication options in the in the course 
I also communicate a fair bit. I used to worry, especially in the early days of the pandemic, that I may have been emailing too often. Um, and actually, even just this past fall semester leading up to the fall and the summer when it was all kind of like up in the air and we had a lot of changes at the last minute, I wrote to my class uh, a lot. <laughs> and I uh, and one of the emails or the, the messages, I think I must have said something about this because students came back and said, that's OK, we'd rather too much than not enough because they weren't hearing at all from some of their instructors. So they, they were just happy to have any kind of information, even if I didn't have full answers to give them about situations. So at least my students have kind of communicated to me that, you know, uh, even if it might seem excessive to me, it, it doesn't seem excessive to them. They're quite happy to have a fair amount of communication, particularly in crisis, uh, in a crisis situation or in a situation where things are changing really, really quickly. Um, so that kind of strategy is, has worked pretty well. Um, I haven't had anybody tell me, stop emailing, you're talking too much. We don't want to hear from you. They've all been pretty, pretty good about it. Okay, I'll pass it off to Sydney. Yeah, I totally agree with with Amber, how you set up your course at the at the beginning in terms of your demeanor, and the way that you communicate in, in, in you know, open language and, and relaxed language and um, you know, I never go, you know, you're an adult, you should figure it out, you know, that kind of thing. I'm always very, you know, please read your course outline, all the answers are there, but if you need help, you can always email me. So that, that is one of the things that I, um, that I find that I can communicate well with my students and them with me. So outside of class time, I use email like you would not believe. It just works so much better. And if I need to email the entire class, I do that through, of course, D2L. Um, and the students will email me constantly about questions they have. They didn't understand a concept in class or whatever the case may be. And it's very difficult to go over some of the concepts in patho and farm and um, you know, nursing interventions because they're, they can be tough. Um, I think I think what what for me um, I do is if I receive an email that like some of them are huge with the questions they have, I just respond back. Let's meet one to one. And if you have friends that have the same questions, this is you know our negotiated date and time that we zoom. And I do one to one zooms all the time. I do. I, I probably do about 10 to 15 one-to-one -one Zooms a week, depending. So I'm always at my desk anyway, working. So if I Zoom for like a half an hour with a student so that they clearly understand the concept, I think it's more, more helpful. Um, and so I tell them that they can contact me all the time. Like you don't, so it, it's based on that open door policy that I used to have when we were in our offices and, you know, we were teaching in person. If a student came to my office, I would drop everything and say, come on in and we'll just go over what you need. Or, um, you know, if a group of them stopped by and I just happened to be there, like it, it's 10, it's 15 minutes out of my time, but it's, it's less um, in the long run, because then the students are understanding the concepts. So, you know, that I, I do that. But when I'm in class, they, I go really fast because there's so much content. And so what I tend to do is I tell this, I stop, right? Are we okay? Is everyone with me? Does anybody have any questions? Um, and then I often find that the students will use chat a ton and I can't keep up with the chat um, even if I have a graduate student that's part of my course that's not usually what I assign them to do so I I'm like constantly going through the chat but to me um, sometimes what I do is I ask the students can somebody else if I've missed something in chat you know flag me down with your hand or um, speak up on your microphone and then I'll respond that way. The last thing really quickly is I never make my students have their cameras on. And I never, like I've never done that. So there are many times 
that I've been the only square <laughs> with a camera on. And I joke and I say, okay, you and me, Sid, we're going to learn this concept if it kills us. And the students laugh and it relaxes because it's usually a really tough concept. And, but I never say you must turn your camera on. I want to see you. I want to, right? Because I, yeah, I just find that um, it closes my class down and I would rather have, um, I'd rather have, um, the students ask questions in chat and they'll they'll monitor it themselves and say hey Sid this is a really good question or can we take a five minute break or even that level of communication during the lecture is I find really really important um, so that the students are are following you because sometimes they get lost in zoom and so anyway that's it. <laughs> On to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Sydney. Um, I think that uh, I, I really appreciate your comments, Amber and Sydney. And I think it goes to show that, like, you know, there's more than one way to pet a cat <laughs> because Sydney and I teach in the same term, often the same group of students, but we have very, very different material to cover. So, so different strategies, we still get to the same finish line, and students are. I mean, I haven't got the evaluations this year, so watch me speak too soon. But students are generally happy with things. So um, so I guess I, just to reinforce the point that like there isn't one answer to any of these things. Um, in terms of how students communicate with each other, I guess I could comment that um, I have a group project and you know there's always there's always challenges with group projects. One of the things I've added this year that's worked really well and I'm going to keep is um, a charter that I got um, from the Taylor Institute. Thank you very much. There's a few different examples. There's one I particularly like. Um, I'll maybe drop the document in the chat after um, after these comments, but um, it's I added it as part of the grade for the assignment. So out of the 15 marks for the group assignment, one mark was that they had done this charter. And I think if I, I, the year before it was like an option, they didn't do it, I don't blame them. And this year making it mandatory really helped. And so one of the two questions in that charter that were the most important to me were, one was how are you going to communicate with each other? And they had to write it down. And so, they used tons of different strategies. They had everything from Instagram, Messenger, Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, phone, like anything you can name, different groups used it. But they had to write down and say, this is what we are going to do. And so the fact that they picked it and deliberately focused on it was great. The other thing they had to answer was, what mark are we aiming for as a group and what amount of work are we willing to put in to achieve that mark? And I think the groups where I had conflict or they were mostly able to self-manage because he said, okay, well, I'm okay with the B. I just want to get out of this course and uh, go back to studying Sydney's. And then other people would say, um, no, I want an A plus. I need to keep a scholarship. This is what I want. And so it brought some of those things out into the open rather than later on where you know, Jennifer's not doing any of her work or she's not helping. And, and I found that was a really, really effective strategy for them to do a little bit of metacognition of like, how are we going to work on this? And what is this process going to look like? And I put at the end of, um, of their comments, like, keep this in mind for future group work so that you know what themes you need to hit on to try and avoid those conflicts in the long run. And I found this year, I maybe had one email of students saying, nobody else is doing anything. And you know what? I was really honest with them. And I said, welcome to life. <laughs> Not in these words, but I said, welcome to life. You're always going to have group members that aren't going to do anything. And so you have to make the decision. Is it important enough that I fill the gap? Or am I going to let it fall and say, I did what I was asked to do, and that's it? And I said, that decision's up to you. And you know, they kind of resolved it that way. So I found that. Kind of pushing the students to really concretely identify those strategies worked really well. The thing that I've 
Um, I mentioned previously, but I'll just say, I really got into using the growth mindset feedback. And at first I found it felt a little bit like coddling for students um, because I had one assignment where on the top of page two, they had to work with the journal article, the top of page two, the article gave very specific pointed clear information and a bunch of them wrote something completely different. So they said the article said ABC and my answer was top of page two it says XYZ. It's right there. Sorry, you're going to lose marks because you can't miss it. So, so the first time I did that, I was pretty blunt with the feedback because uh, frankly, I was frustrated that they would make such a silly mistake. And um, you know what, that didn't help anybody move forward. So instead, I with the I had some of those sessions one on one with people at the TI, I made this worksheet, which is never far from um, from my hand. And I have phrases like, I encourage you to reread page two. You'll note at the top, there may be information which could have strengthened this answer. And the message is still there. I'm still telling them this is very obviously in the material and that's why you didn't get a mark for this. But now they are so much happier and they don't feel like I'm attacking them. And um, I will never go back because this has completely changed the tone of the communication. And when students email me upset about a mark, it, the, di the discourse is completely different. First of all, those emails have dropped way off. And now if they email, and I, I offer strategies like for your next assignment, I suggest you consider strengthening your writing by using more paragraphs because you have two complete pages that are the same paragraph. Using more paragraphs will help me as a reader. And they can't kind of get mad at that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the aim is to help them move forward, but I found it just completely changes the tone because if they want to appeal that or they want to regrade, they have to come back with something as to like, okay, well, why is the suggestion to use more paragraphs in your future writing? Why is that not, appropriate and like there's no answer to that right so it kind of stops a lot of that really negative back and forth and I think that's the best thing I have done as an educator so far and will continue to do because beforehand I was awful this has really fixed a big problem in my life so thanks Jennifer I know I'm inspired by some of those strategies, so thank you. Looking forward to sharing some of those resources too. Uh, you know, I'm conscientious of the time, and I know we got a late start, so we have about 10 minutes left. Definitely want to ensure that we get to question three, but also have some time for questions. So, uh, Sydney, if you want to get us started off, and then yeah. Jennifer, Amber, and hopefully we'll have time for questions. Okay. Um, well, I already mentioned because we're talking about communication tools, um, so in this one so i've already mentioned two that i use i use chat big time and i use annotate um which i find works really really well but one of the other things that i use is jamboard and so i'll set up a jamboard where i ask the students if there's any and i sometimes i set up questions in there for them to help them study so after this class you know, these are the three main areas, which is kind of a hint for their exam. Um, you know, these are the three main areas and here are some questions for you to consider. And then I'll keep going back and forth to the Jamboard. I don't like the discussion board on D2L very much. Um, I, don't, I don't like it as, mal as much, but the Jamboard, I really find that the students use that quite a bit. Um, so, the other thing I'll use Jamboard for, if, if you remember back in the day when we were in person, um, we I had what was called a uh, parking lot. So often students will bring up questions that we either talked about in a previous class, is not germane to the con what we're talking about right now, or I have no idea where this student is coming from. Um, so rather than be you know, because no one's perfect. And Jennifer, I applaud you for being frank about some of the things that we learn along the way, because no one's perfect. Um, but there has been days where I've been 
I've been known to say, really, that's your question? Yeah, because you get a little tired. You do, you do. Um, I'm more so that way on Zoom than I am in person. It's kind of odd. So I have to really watch that constantly. So what I do is I say, hey, that's a really great question um, because I find that questions are communication. Students ask questions when they don't understand. And so I say, that's a really good question. I've set up a Jamboard and I throw it up on the chat. And I say, if you have any questions that, I, that I can, I'm not gonna answer because it's not really what we're talking about today, throw it up there and I will respond to them and then I'll post my answers. You can either go to the Jamboard or I create a separate document and put it on D2L under the lecture that I've posted. So yeah, I use Jamboard actually quite a bit because it's it just reminded me so much of the parking lot. And then you can move on in your class because you can go down these tangents with your students and then I can't get through what I'm supposed to get through. Um, and then the students are feel that they haven't received what they needed to receive. So there's mine. I'm going to cut it short there. Over to Jennifer. Or, sorry, Amber and Jennifer. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, same things. Um, email, Zoom chat, D2 all announcements and, and all of that. Um, and like I said, I use the q and I use the discussion board with a Q&A, which really helps students just answer each other's questions um, and has really cut down on the amount of emails I get, which is nice. Um, also the grading feedback in D2L, I found D2L has really improved over the last about three years, you know, with the rubrics, the feedback box, the annotation tools, like it just allows for a lot of feedback and communication with students around their assessments that I really like. One that I'll add into the mix is Discord, since this has come up a lot in the last couple of uh, years. I've had two distinct, very different experiences with a large online class and Discord. The first one was amazing. Um, it was for the winter of 2020 when we did the transition and a student in my class created a Discord server for our course. And it was one of the main ways that I communicated with people. All, now, not the whole, the whole course was not in Discord. So some students didn't join um, the Discord. So I still, of course, sent emails and put announcements up, but there was a lot of like more fun back and forth, quick question and answer stuff on Discord, which was really good. Um, and we had a very good time um, and there was kind of some fun things that we did on there. And given the situation at the time where everybody was kind of, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic and everybody was really unsure what was going on and feeling quite um, anxious, um, you know, we were kind of at the height of it then, it really allowed for a really lovely community uh, on there. There was a lot of students out of my 350 on there, not all of them, but an awful lot, like definitely over a hundred. Um, and that was great. Um, my second experience with Discord, I created a server for an online class for that spring or summer, I think it was. Complete flop. Absolute complete flop. Nobody was into it. Nobody liked it. It was a complete waste of time. Um, and so I think maybe being that the factor in that was not just the circumstance, but me, maybe I am not the one who should be creating this. Like maybe it needs to be student run if you want to use that. I mean, the other thing with Discord, of course, that everybody's heard about is the potential for academic dishonesty uh, using Discord for that kind of thing. Um, I have not encountered that with my particular courses. Uh, I haven't seen it used for that. I have, and I have joined Discord servers um, without them knowing it was me and to watch what they were doing. Um, uh, because I'm somebody did create one in a later class um, last summer, and they didn't realize I think that they had emailed everybody in D2L for it, and so they also emailed me. So I joined with my username, which is not anywhere close to my name, and the, and just watched them because I thought this will be interesting to see. The most they did was share bootleg copies of the textbook, 
uh, to save each other money. Um, so that was the only thing they really got up to that was bad. They didn't actually use it to cheat or to, and actually the student who was running it was great. She, every time we had, we had quizzes at a set time every week, every time those quizzes came around, she shut Discord down. She's like, basically there's a thing that the, the person who creates it has control over where they basically, they can shut it down for a certain amount of time and then open it back up again. And so she was like super into having a very proper <laughs> a Discord environment. Um, so that was nice. So I was happy to let them go on and, 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 and use it. Um, so I think it's, it's very much circumstance and situation based. Discord is not always gonna work and it's not also always going to be a terrible thing either. It can be a great thing in a course. So I just wanted to share my two kind of experiences with it, two main experiences with it, because it is, it is, it is out there. Students are using it. Whether you want to actually make that an active part of your course or not is, is, is up to you, but it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. It can actually be a really wonderful thing and a way to communicate with your students if you're interested in tools outside of like Zoom and D2L. Okay, I'll hand it off to Jenna. Thanks, Amber. Oh. Great. I'll just quickly, I, I can echo everything that my colleagues have said, and I would just quickly add that um, I find that I get a lot of benefit out of Zoom. And one area that I wasn't expecting was that students can send you private messages. So sometimes um, they would get, I would get private messages that are questions. And I feel like that's brought more people into the fold because the ones who are confident to put their hand up and ask a question they are still going to do that. But I feel like I'm capturing like an extra kind of percentile of students that might not have that confidence in the classroom setting or in the synchronous Zoom call, but they will, they are thinking about it and they will ask me questions through the, um, the private message. And I think that's been really interesting because I've seen, okay, some of these people that are, I wasn't sure, you know, if they were engaging at all, they are getting it far enough that they will write something down. And, and sometimes I sometimes I ask people like to unmute and contribute, but other times I say, just put in the chat what answer you think you would give to this. And I think I'm getting a lot more engagement that way. So, so it's tapping into something there um, that I didn't expect or plan for, but has, has been really good. I also plan to use Zoom in the future, even if we are back in person, I find for high risk conversations, however just defined, um, I feel a lot safer. So um, if, if a student is really upset and, um, and needs to express that or something, um, I find that that can be, I just feel safer because if things really go off the rails, you can just close the call rather than have someone physically in your office. Um, I mean, that's a very, very rare instance, but, um, but I do like to know that it's there. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. 